All right, we're going to be in the book of Hebrews to start with. My wife demanded that I give her a title, so tonight's title is Righteousness Has a Name. Does anybody know what the name of righteousness is? Come on, shout it out loud. Thank you, Lord. That's right, Jesus. Righteousness has a name, and his name is Jesus. Amen. So we're going to be in Hebrews chapter 12. And I'm going to get you started. We're going to start reading <coughs> in uh, verse 5. <coughs> but ultimately, I want to get you to uh, verse 11. Okay? So let's go ahead and start reading. I'm in the King James Version for this particular scripture right here. So it says, And you have, and you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when you are rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and he scourges every son whom he receives. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the father chastens not? But if you be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are you bastards and not sons. It means you're fatherless, right? I want you to I want you to know before we get going good that the scripture teaches us in John chapter one that God sent Jesus the light from heaven into the earth. Amen. In the midst of darkness. And the scripture teaches us in John chapter one that those that were willing to believe on his name, that to those people he gave power to become the sons or the children of God. Yes. Sometimes you get out there, you start doing some witnessing, and they're like, oh, we're, we're all God's children. No, no, ma'am. No, sir. I don't mean to be ugly, but that's not true. We're all God's creation. That's right. That's right. But in order to be God's child, you have to believe in the name of Jesus. You have to believe in what Jesus came to do. Amen. And you have to be converted. You have to be born again. Amen. And once you are born again, then the scripture teaches that you are now a son or a child of God. Amen. Yeah. And, and look what the scripture says right here is that he chastens those that belong to him. He brings them through discipline Amen. And, and, and don't despise it. Right. Sometimes, you know, sometimes people, they, they, they grow faint and they grow weary in the midst of discipline. I don't know about you, but look, I, I've been a person that didn't like a whole lot of discipline in my life. I didn't like, I didn't like you to tell me what you, you know what I'm getting at? And, and I want you to know that, that we shouldn't be that way. We, we need to ask the Lord to have his way in our heart so that we'd be softened towards his correction. Amen? Amen. So it says, but if you be without chastisement, then you're fatherless, right? Verse 9. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh. That's talking about in the physical, which corrected us and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the father of spirits and live? For they barely for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. I want you to see that. See, the Lord's will for your life is that you and I in the journey would become partakers of his holiness. Right. Many times we're over here praying that the Lord would give us the blessing and what the Lord's really wanting to do. The, he's a blessing God. He wants to prosper us. He wants to bless us. Amen. But he's really more interested in the journey that's going to get us from point A to point B. Amen. And many times what's happening is, is that, well, like the Apostle Paul said, we're kicking against the goads. Yes. Now, that's another, in one of the translations, it says the kicking against the pricks. And what that's talking about, you know, many of you know that is, is that nowadays they have cattle prods, right? Back in the day, though, they had sharp sticks. And they'd hit them in the hindquarters to get them moving in the right direction. And the Lord told the Apostle Paul when his name was Saul, you're kicking against the goats. I'm over here trying to direct you and get you to go into the right direction and you're, you're not listening. And so the Lord desires that we would be the kind of children that would receive his correction because he's got a plan for our lives that we would become partakers of his holiness. Amen. Praise God. Look at verse 11. It says, Now no chastening for the present seems to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterwards, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness. That's what I wanted you to see there. So he wants you to be a partaker of his holiness. 
But look, after it has its way, it brings it, it brings forth a crop, if yeah. you will. That's what a yield means, right? It brings forth a crop. It brings forth a crop of righteousness, right? And it says, the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. You know, and he says that he says, no chastening at the present seems to be joyous. And, you know, there's a lot of times with people nowadays, you know, gyms all the rage. I'm going to the gym or, you know, and sometimes people just don't feel like going to the gym. I don't want to go to the gym. Well, you're not going to get any effects if you're unwilling to go to the gym. You can talk about it all you want to. And it's the same thing when it comes to discipline, discipline, discipline from the Lord. If we don't learn how to endure the trials of life, because many times the discipline and the chastening that we get from the Lord are from the trials. God, listen, God knows how to turn his back into the right direction. It, 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 many times, yes, it's the conflict that we put on ourselves without us even realizing it. But the God, God knows how to use it. God knows how to send a storm to pick Jonah up, my friend. Yes, yes. You can try to run from him all you want to, but he'll, he'll make a tailor-made storm just for you. And he'll send a fish to go pick you up. Hey, man, that's, I believe that. I believe in the word of God. Hey, man, Jonah's like, man, I'm the problem here. What are you doing down there? Sleeper, call on your God. He said, I'm the problem. Throw me yes. in the water and your storm will stop. Amen. Hey, man, but God knows how to get his people where he's trying to get them. And the problem with us is, is that many times we're fighting against him and we're kicking against kicking against the goads. But the Lord would say, man, if you just trust me and you, just, you would just yield to me. Amen. Amen. Praise God. So I want to talk to you tonight about righteousness. And I want you to know that, that discipline helps us to get to that place. The discipline of God in our life helps us to get to the place where that peaceable fruit of righteousness is produced in our life. So I want you to see that. And i got to be honest with you before we move forward. This is the same thing we talked about Sunday night at Bible study. It was so good. Like I couldn't just let it. I couldn't just let it go. And so this is a corporate effort. I mean, look, everybody was throwing in information and it just it just came out so so good i'm not telling you that i'm going to preach it that good but it was the holy spirit was moving and 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 it was just a real blessing all right so from there i want to bring you to matthew chapter 5 uh verse 6 and you can actually put that up and you can just leave it up but while he's doing that i want you i want to know that many scholars and commentators Describe the gospel of Matthew as the king's gospel, if you will. Meaning that because of the fact that the genealogy, it goes through David's lineage, but specifically it goes through King Solomon. And Solomon was the heir to the throne. And that was Joseph's lineage. But even in Mary's lineage, I'm not trying to get off on that out of Luke, it goes through David's house also, but it goes through David's son Nathan. But but this but Solomon was the rightful heir to the throne. And we don't have time to get into it, but had the children of Israel Israel not rebelled and been under Babylonian captivity and then Persian captivity and then Grecian captivity and then Roman captivity. Joseph would have been the rightful heir to, to the throne. And then Jesus would have, as the firstborn. So Jesus was literally the rightful heir as the king of the Jews for the Jewish nation. And so I just wanted to point that out to you before we get into this next concept is that in Matthew 5 verse 6, this is Jesus and he's on the mountain, and they call this the Sermon on the Mount, where he begins to preach these Beatitudes, right? And when he's the king, even though he doesn't look like a king, he, he doesn't look any, he looks like a common man. He's just coming out of his carpenter uh, job, okay? And, and, he's, and, and the crowds are following him, and he's up there on the mountain, and he begins to speak to the citizens or the would-be citizens of his kingdom. And this, and this is what he tells them. You see, before before he gets to bless or they that hunger and thirst for righteousness, he actually let me, let me go ahead and go to it real quick. Matthew chapter five, verse verses like four and five. I want you to see this. He he says in these in these verses of scripture, he says, "Blessed are the poor in spirit; theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn." For they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And what I want you to notice here is to be reminded of the fact that Jesus rode into town on a donkey. That doesn't look anything like a king. And, and what I want you to, and he was born in a manger amongst amongst stinky animals. That doesn't look anything like a king. Kings are born in palaces and they got soft clothes and, and you know silken clothing, but not Jesus. 
Because, and, and look what it says. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Like, who wants to be poor in spirit? God wants his people to be poor in spirit. Yeah. What that means is not dependent upon self. Yeah. Amen. He wants, he said, if you're going to come unto me, you're going to come out and come as a child. Yes. Because a child is, is, not de is not independent. They're dependent upon their father. I need some milk, mommy. We got some mamas in the house. Y'all know what I'm talking about. I need some help, mama. I can't get into... I need some help, Father. Amen. So we're going to be poor in spirit, not prideful, not lifted up. Amen. See, that's why people don't really want the real Jesus. Come on. I'm not even getting going good yet. That's why people don't even really want the real Jesus. Yes, yes. Because instead, we're still so full of self and so puffed up. And we don't really want to die. But Jesus said, if you're going to follow after me, you're going to pick up your cross. You're going to deny yourself. And you're going to follow after me. He said, if somebody's going to try to save their life, they're going to lose it. And if somebody loses their life for my sake, they're going to to gain eternal life. Hallelujah. I listened to Br Brother Larson the other day. Uh, John sent me a video and he quoted one of his Bible students. It was a girl, dude. It was so good when he said, she said, when she was preaching to the class, she said, you, she said, Jesus died and you think, you thought he was going to let you live? Come on. Come on, somebody. Come on, church. Jesus died on the cross and you thought he was going to let you live. He's talking about your flesh. He's talking about your old man. It don't work that way. If you're going to come to the Lord and if you're going to journey this pathway with the Lord, self's got to die. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. And sometimes dying to self is painful. Yeah. That's the truth right there. He said, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those that mourn. Why do I got to mourn? Well, that's a good point. You know, I got to give some credit. Like John made the comment. How, where you see the most mourning at a funeral? <laughs> Lord, help us to die. But look, God the Father is mourning. When he, I can promise you right now, when God looks upon the face of the earth and he sees the wickedness that's going on and he sees the travesties and the heartache, God wants his people to mourn for what he mourns for. But most of us are so caught up, oh, Lord help us, in the American dream church. That we're, that, and we're so, we so caught up in us four and no more. And we're not really consumed and concerned about the cares and the things of God. And our heart's not broken and mourning over what God is mourning for. He's looking for some people that will mourn with him. He's looking for some people that will cry out and ask him to move. Amen. And look, he says, and the meek shall inherit the earth. I was preaching to them prisoners. You know, prisoners understand some stuff today. And I was like, you know, because everybody's trying to climb the ladder themselves and they're stepping on people's hands and they're kicking them in the face. And, you know, and, and, and anything that I can do to get the upper hand. I ain't got no shame in my game. That's how people in the, in the world roll. And, they, and we think that that's cool, right? That's what the world teaches us. But look at this. It says, blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness and they shall be filled. <laughs> Man, he, he didn't say blessed are they that drive a new Cadillac. He didn't say blessed are they that, you know, wear a three-piece suit. No, 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 no. Oh. He said blessed are yeah. they which do hunger yeah. and thirst. Yeah. After righteousness. And you know, you don't even know that you're hungry till you don't have something. Right? I didn't, if you go a few hours or several hours without a meal, all of a sudden your stomach starts grumbling. And you're like, I don't really have what I need right now. I'm, or I'm thirsty. I start to get dehydrated and I feel weak. Man, I, I don't think I've drank in, in a few hours. I need some water, right? And that's one of the beautiful things about the discipline of God. He'll get you to the place where you begin to realize you need something that you don't have, yes. my friend. That's right. Amen. And he'll bring you to the place where you start to realize, you know what? I don't have righteousness. Yes, yes. yes. I don't have the righteousness of my Jesus. I, I need the hunger and thirst after that righteousness. Lord, have your way on the inside of me. Amen. And, and you know, one of the things that Sister Gail came up with, too, <coughs> in the Bible study was that whenever we go through the discipline of the Lord, and many times, if anybody in this house tonight would be honest, even after we've known the Lord, we've, we've probably, well, we have. Yes. We've walked away from the Lord yes. to some extent. We've gone our own way. We've done our own will, Right. And it doesn't mean that we quit loving him. We just basically rebelled against him is what we did. 
And even in the midst of all of that, God, Jesus, he kept, he came after us. Yes. Amen. Because you wouldn't be here tonight if he didn't. Yes. He came after you because he loves you and he's not going to, he's not going to let you go. He, he's going to keep on calling your name. And as long as you got breath in your lungs, amen, he's going to keep on calling your name. Praise God. And, you know, Sister Gail just made the comment. That's whenever it happens. Who sings that song, huh? You can sing that song for me, Yvette. I know it's Micah's song, but you can sing it. Your name is like honey on my lips. See, that's what Sister Gail said. She said, she said that after you've been running from him, and he brings you back, and you, you realize that he loved you in spite of yourself, yes, yes. and you realize that he loved you even after you had done what you had done to him, that the love of God overwhelmed you, amen? And the next thing, and that's why I love that song, your name is like honey on my lips. Just sing us a couple of verses, and you can hold on to the microphone. Praise God. Jesus. Jesus, your name is like honey on my lips, your spirit like water to my soul, your word is a lamp unto my feet, Jesus. I love you. I love you. Thank you, sister. Hallelujah. Praise Hallelujah. God. His name is like honey. Yes. I want to be that man. I want his name to be like honey on my lips. Amen. I don't I don't want to be worried about what another man's gonna think about me. Man, listen, you might think I'm weird. You may think I'm I'm a Jesus freak. You might think I'm weird, but you don't understand. You don't know nothing about me, my friend. And some of you do, I know. But look, don't like I heard a preacher say the other day, I don't know how he said it, but he said don't don't be making fun of somebody or giving them a hard time for how they worship the Lord when you don't really know what the Lord done pulled them out of. Amen. 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 And I don't know about you, but I'm so grateful. Hallelujah. Amen. I know that's why some people don't really love the Lord because they haven't done nothing really wrong that the Lord had to pull them out of, but I'm just kind of I know that ain't true. But sometimes that's really the problem. People think that they're okay because they didn't do what I did. Or they think that they're okay because they weren't as bad as they were. Right? Well, no, no, no. That's not how it works. The Bible says that we all fall short. We, that we've all sinned and all fall short of the glory of God. See, born of Adam, you were born with a sinful nature. And until you're born again, you're, 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 you're ready to split hell wide open, my friend. Because you're not getting in on your own righteousness. Come on, that's what we're talking about tonight. We're talking about righteousness. And I'm here to tell you that righteousness has a name. And his name is not Matt Abed. Amen? His name is Jesus. Praise God. And I just need you to know that. Amen? All right. Hallelujah. So, look, what I wanted you to see, this was something that was... That was really, really good also, I thought. And uh, we're going to kind of get into this a little bit. But uh, actually, it, it was a conversation that um, that John and I had. And, and, and it came out of 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 7. And what was interesting is that he sent me a text about this. And I had just read that the day before. And it's that scripture where it talks about this. It says, unto you, therefore, which believe, he is precious. Talking about Jesus. But unto them which are disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner. Now, I got to work with this text a little bit to get you uh, to understand uh, what's going on here. The scripture says he's to you that believe. If you're a believer, then Jesus is precious. Just like the sister saying, his name is like honey on our lips. But to them that were disobedient, specifically, he's talking about the religious leaders of Israel. Because once they, you know, and I was thinking about this the other day, there's actually one spot in the gospel where they're actually colluding with each other on the side. Yeah. They're having a conversation. They're like, if he is the son of David, what's going to happen to us? Like, really? Did you just say that? The prophets have been telling you that the son of David's coming, and now he's here, and you think it might be him, and you'd rather kill him because you're scared you're going to lose your own position. And that's part of the problem that we have as believers. We don't want to die to ourselves. We don't want to let self die so that Jesus can rule and reign as king. We're standing in the way of what Jesus wants to do. 
Amen. So he, he says he's precious, but unto them that were disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, they rejected Jesus. He was the stone, right? But look at this. It says the same has been made the head of the corner. And I've shared this with you guys before, but back then they didn't have cement. So whenever they built a foundation, they would lay a cornerstone. And, and Jesus is the cornerstone. And the apostles built the foundation off of the cornerstone. And the scripture right here, Peter, even though we're not going to get into it, said he's a living stone. And he's made you lively stones. And you're being built up upon the foundation to be a place that can have, that can, that, that, that habitates the presence of God. Amen. So he's the head of the corner. And, 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 and you know, they don't want to die. Like these, these religious leaders don't want to die. I put in my notes, have you ever watched a person die? I, I have, you know, I, I've seen a lot of people die as an ICU nurse. And I, I don't ever remember one of them that enjoyed it. Now, I'm not, some of them were more tormented than others. Some of them were more scared than others. Some didn't seem scared at all. Okay, but I'm just here to tell you, I never saw anybody enjoying themselves while they were dying. And the point that I'm trying to make is, is that in the life, in our life with Christ, you're, you're probably not going to enjoy your flesh dying. It's a painful process, but it, it's something that has to be done. Now, this is <laughs> this is where I want to get to right here. Verse eight, a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. Basically, what it's saying right there is that Jesus was a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense to the religious leaders and that they stumbled at the word. Amen. And, and, and I just remember that, you know, I was actually talking. I've talked to a lot of y'all. And, you know, sometimes I'm like, after the fact, I'm like, I don't know, man. You think the message was a little too hard? You know, and, and many of y'all have been very gracious towards me. But that's something that I've been dealing with ever since I first started preaching. I'm just going to be honest with you. The first time I preached, I pretty much preached like this. I mean, I, my words were more like choppy. But I'm just saying, like, I acted like this. Because the first time I opened my mouth for the Lord, this is just kind of how it came out. All right? And what I'm trying to say is this, is that, but the whole time, you know, you would see sometimes people, you could tell that they were upset about what was being said. Right? And I had people come up to me after, man, that was a really good message. I'll see you next week. I'll, I'm going to start and you never see him again. And then, so you start wondering in your heart, like, did I do something wrong? Did I say something wrong? You know, and, and, and all of my life, all of my life in ministry, I kind of like said, I don't do it in front of y'all. Like when I'm up here, I try not to do it like that. But a lot of times it's after the fact, like, like, and I'll talk to Donnell, what you think? You know, I mean, kind of. And so, you know, what I wanted to bring all that up for was this, is that, is that John again? I don't mean to keep on talking about John or puffing somebody up or patting somebody on the back, but he sent me a text because I, I think I was talking to him about that. And this, this hit me so hard and we brought it up in the Bible study and it was so, so good. I put it right here. This is a quote from John. He'll probably preach it next time he preaches. So then you got to let it because praise God. He said this because see, it's the different people getting offended at the word. You understand that? People get offended at the word. And this is what he said. The truth is until one becomes offended at themselves, there is no hope. Until somebody becomes offended with themselves. What I'm trying to say is, is that how we've gone against the Lord, how we thought we were okay, how we were prideful in our heart. And we realized that self needed to die, but that, but that we, you know what I'm saying? That we were holding on to self. Even the world tries to tell us to hold on to self-esteem and to hold on self-preservation. And the word of the Lord is saying, no, the word of the Lord says, crucify self. Amen. Self has to die so that Jesus, amen, can be manifest in our lives. Because as long as we're alive and as long as we're getting in the way, then people are not going to be able to see Jesus. That's right. I told my man, look, I was so excited about that today when I was thinking about it. I was like, brother, I think you set me free in ministry. I'm telling you right now, hallelujah. I'm so fired up. I'm so excited. I, I, I think I want to take a run around the church. Praise God. I'm telling you right now, hallelujah. You're going to set me free in ministry. I, you know what? I ain't trying to offend nobody. 
somebody. I prefer nobody ever get offended. But if the word of God offends somebody, so be it. Because maybe it'll drive you to your knees. And maybe it'll put a nail in the, in the hand on the cross. And maybe you'll die to yourself. And maybe Jesus will be formed in you. Praise God. That's good preaching right there. Not because it's coming from me, but because it's the word of the Lord. Amen. 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 We're talking about righteousness and that it has a name. Let's look at Romans chapter 1, verse 16 through 17. The apostle Paul said this, I am not ashamed Hallelujah. of the gospel of Christ. Amen. Most of y'all have been in the faith long enough. You know that the word gospel means the good news. You know, before there was ever the good news, though the good news was always there, but before it was manifest, there was some bad news. God created the heaven and the earth and all that in them is, and then there was a failure in the garden, and the whole earth was fallen. But God had a plan. It was a lamb that was foreordained before the foundation of the earth, Peter told us. He said, you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold, but by a lamb that was prepared in advance. See, God knew what man was going to do. And God knew what you were going to do. But he prepared a lamb for you. He prepared a sacrifice for you, my friend. That's how much God loves you. Hallelujah. And, 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 and so he says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believes. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. Look at this. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. What I wanted you to see is this. Is that God's righteousness is revealed through the gospel of the Christ. Yes, yes. I'm not trying to be mean, but I'm trying to tell you right now, Christian, if you ain't got this book open, you need to get this book open and you need to put your you need to put the word of the Lord in your heart. As you begin to read this word, it will reinculturate you. See, the world's trying to this is a good place to say this. The world's trying to conform you, right? Trying to fashion you and mold you. From the outside, I preach that all the time. Y'all are probably tired of hearing that. Through the music industry, through Hollywood, any kind of way it can get its hands on you. It wants to make you look like the world. Look, man, this is so good right here. This is so good, man. I, look, I know I preached the, those two verses of scripture, but in Romans chapter 12, and you don't really have to turn there, but, but you know, you can. He says in verse 1, he says in Romans 12, verse 1, he says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. Right, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. What does that mean? You died, but yet you live. It means you died in Christ, amen. You were buried with him, Romans 6, but now you've resurrected in Christ. The scripture teaches us that the same spirit that raised him from the dead will also bring life to your mortal body. Right. And so that's the first part is that you die. Now go to the verse two. It says this. He says, and be not conformed to this world. That word conformed right there literally means to be fashioned from the outside. But instead, be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. The truth of God's word will, again, will reinculturate you. But what I want you to see, and I don't think I ever saw it like this the other, the, before, but as I was talking about it the other day, it hit me in a way like never before. I've said this before. The word transformed right there is the same word for transfigured. Okay? And I've, I've preached this so many times. The word transformed right there is the same word for transfigured whenever Jesus was transfigured before them. And so what that means is that on that day, what was in Jesus, his deity, right? Because he never stopped being God, he, but he was the man God. He was the God man, amen? And so on that day, the deity or the godness that was in him shone out of him. The glory of God shone out of him because that's who he really was. Well, I'm here to tell you that the word for that, for that word in the Greek is metamorphia. It's where we get the word metamorphosis. And, and we all know it, but we, we learned that in junior high that a worm has butterfly DNA on the inside of it. 
But it can't become a butterfly until it gets in that cocoon and it dies to its original nature, which was a worm. And then, and then it comes back alive, right, as a butterfly. And, and what I want you to know is, is that who Jesus was, was deity. And look, what it's saying right here is, is that now you're going to, you're a living sacrifice. If you gave your heart to Christ, if you're a born again Christian, the spirit of God lives on the inside of you. And as you start to die, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present yourselves a living sacrifice. As you start to die, something amazing starts to happen. Oh, something amazing starts to happen. The glory of God, that which is in you, who's in you? Jesus is in you. That's his name. And you, and when you received him, the presence of the Holy Spirit came to live on the inside of you. When you may not know it, but if you're born again, the moment you said yes to Jesus in your heart, the Holy Spirit moved on the inside of you. The Spirit of the Christ lives in you. And when you start to die, hallelujah, the next thing you know, the glory of God becomes begins to be revealed because people start to see less of you yeah. and they start to see yeah. more of Jesus. Yeah. It's the fruit of the Spirit yeah. that's being produced in your life. I want you to know that righteousness has a name, amen? amen. amen. And it's revealed in the gospel. The righteousness of God is revealed through the gospel, oh, amen? Yeah. Romans chapter 3, verses 21 through 22. says this but now the righteousness of God without the law is manifest so I got to slow down a little bit I got to calm down a little bit because I got to try to teach for a sec okay before before Jesus was ever on the earth one of the purposes of the law was to reveal God's character to humanity okay the world was full of sin God created a nation out of a man named Abraham, and the name of that nation was Israel, and he gave those Hebrew children the law. And the law taught his people what he was expected of them. It showed them his righteousness. It showed them his holiness. But what this scripture is saying right now is that the righteousness of God without the law is manifest. You know what the word manifested means? It means like you can see it. It's here now. You can see it. Amen? And so what I need you to know is this, is that when he's saying the righteousness of God is, is here, you can see it. He's talking about Jesus. And, and look, he goes on to say it right here. He says, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith. I'm sorry. Let me, let me back up a little bit. The righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. <clears throat> And this is what I did at the jail today. I said, okay, y'all been in some courtrooms before? All right. So what do they do? They pull a witness up to the stand. The law and the prophets. Some of y'all may not know that, but the law is the first five books of the Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, uh, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Okay. And the first five books of the, of the law, that's the law. And the prophets entail, you know, Jeremiah, Isaiah, Jonah, Hosea. You get the point. And what, this, what Paul is saying is, is that both the law and the prophets witnessed that righteousness was coming. It witnessed that Jesus, now we know he's here, it's manifest, is the righteousness of God. Does that, does that make yeah. sense? Yes. And, and what, I, what I said today was, I said, it'd be almost like, I don't know, the, the prophet Jeremiah said, put your... Put your Put your, what does it say? Put your hand on the Bible and raise your right hand. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So help you God. Yes. Or let's use Isaiah. Yes, I swear to tell the whole truth. And he said, and, and you know, the Lord's going to, a son is going to be given unto us. And the government's going to rest on his shoulders. And then later he'd say in Isaiah chapter 53 that he's going to be stricken to the point where you won't even be able to recognize him. And then he's going to bear our sorrows and he's going to bear our iniquities upon him. That's the testimony that I'm here to tell you from the prophets 
that there's one that's coming. And Moses would have put his hand on the Bible and would have raised it right in. He said, the Lord told me to tell y'all back whenever I was leading the children of Israel that there was going to be a prophet like me and that you were to listen to him. And I'm here to tell you that he's here now. He's manifested now. And now you know his name is Jesus. Hallelujah. Yes. The righteousness of God. Look at verse 22. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe. Mike, could you do me a favor run back there real quick? Mike, could you run back there real quick? Grab that black uh, thing off of the counter up there on top of that. And yeah, I wish I had my white one, but yeah, you can just chunk it over here, bud. Thank you, sir. He said, look what it says right there. It says, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe. If you're saved tonight, you need to know, I know this is going to be weird. Some people don't like to be messed with. But if you're saved tonight, the righteousness of Christ has been laid upon you. Amen. It's, it's like you've been laid upon by Jesus' righteousness. It's a covering. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. All right. I'm not going to do it to the piano. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the righteousness of Christ has been laid upon you. Amen. And you need to understand that. That it's a, and, and listen, we're about to get into the next scripture. But I want you to know that it, that it's not something you earn. That's right. The righteousness of of God is not something you can earn. It's not about your actions. It's about His actions. That's right. The Bible said He came and He fulfilled the law of God. And then he offered his life as a sacrifice to pay the penalty of the sins of the human race. The Bible says that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. He fulfilled the law and then he offered his life as a sacrifice. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Let's go down to verse 24 through 26. It says, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood. Okay, look, before we move forward, that's a fancy word that a lot of times people aren't really used to that particular word. And I'm not going to get into how I normally use the word. <laughs> I need you to understand that the Greek language was in existence before the New Testament writers wrote the New Testament. Does that make sense? In other words, that's the language they spoke in Greece, all over the known world. They spoke it in Rome. Rome. When Jesus was born in, in Bethlehem during the Roman Empire, they spoke Greek. Okay? That's why they made a Greek translation of the Old Testament scriptures. Okay? Everybody spoke Greek because of Alexander the Great. All right. But, but what I want you to see is this. Is that the Greek people used this word before, before Jesus. So the New Testament writers are making it their own. But what it meant in the, in the way the Greek writers used it was you got to offer a sacrifice to appease the gods. The gods are angry with you. And so in order to make them happy with you, you have to offer a sacrifice. That's not what they were talking about. They were explaining Paul's explaining that Jesus was that sacrifice that appeased the wrath of God. You understand that judgment is coming on the human race. Yeah. And it's very important that you understand that. But the good news is this, is that if you have received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, your judgment has already been paid for. Does that make yeah. sense? Yeah. Because your judgment was paid for on him. Amen. And you don't have to be judged for your own sin. Praise God. That's awesome. Because the kind of judgment we're talking about, like I preached about a week ago, is not for a weekend. It's not like the Europeans say, are you going on holiday? No. This kind of judgment, the wrath of God is going to be for eternity. And those that refuse Christ, because see, does that, hopefully that makes a little bit of sense for you. It's like how, because I've heard people say before, how can you... Love a God that's going to send people to hell. And I, I always say it. I'm like, hold on, time out, boss. God ain't sending nobody to hell. God sent his son. He sent a lamb. 
He sent a lamb, the Lamb of God. He sent His Son to die. But 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 people don't want that. Right. Amen. They, they they don't want that. But see, God is righteous. He's a righteous judge, and, and, and He's got to judge sin. And and so, instead of destroying the whole human race, He had a plan in place. And his plan was that he was ultimately going to give the world Jesus. Amen. And, and, and listen, and he always had people, even in the old days, that were following after him through the sacrificial system, waiting for Jesus to come and, and make its fulfillment. Yes, yes. And so people have either accepted God's way or they've rejected God's way. Yes. And, if you, and, if you, and if they've accepted God's way, they won't have to face judgment. Yes. Because, see, the righteousness of God has been given to them. Because of what Jesus did. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Yes. And, and it goes on to say this. To declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past. I mean, just think about that. God allowed Jesus to be the sacrifice. And he's declaring his righteousness. Jesus is righteous. You know, this is, a good example of this is one time I was ministering to a Muslim lady. And I think I'll, maybe I've told you all this story before. I was ministering to a Muslim lady and I kind of studied some stuff about Islam and I, something stuck in my head. There's this commentary that Muhammad wrote called the Hadith and it explains some stuff about the Quran. And when I was trying to talk to her about Jesus and about the sacrifice, I remembered the quote. Muhammad said that with one drop of the martyr's blood, all his sin is atoned. And so I quoted that to her. I said, Muhammad said in the Hadith that one drop of the martyr's blood, all the sin is atoned. But I said, man, that doesn't work. Because you see, the martyr's blood was tainted with sin. Your blood is tainted with sin. My blood is tainted with sin. I deserve to die. The wages of sin is death. But that's why God had to become a man. And the sinless one died to pay the penalty of sin. <laughs> you, that's, you don't get no better than that, my friend. You can rest assured tonight that if you have received Christ Jesus as your Lord and Savior, and you know it if you have because the Holy Spirit doesn't move into your heart, and you're not living, you cannot, you can try to run from Him, but you, you, you know good and well that you're uncomfortable because the Holy Spirit's convicting you, Amen. and He's speaking to you. Amen. I want to encourage you, listen, you don't have to necessarily do it in the church tonight, but if you have not gotten on your knees and asked the Lord Jesus Christ into your heart and asked forgiveness of your sin and said, thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross for me. Won't you come into my heart? Won't you forgive me? Lord, I believe you died for me and I believe you rose from the dead. You need to cry out to Jesus, man. You don't want to stand before God on that day in your own righteousness and had not allowed Jesus to take your judgment for you. Because it's going to happen, friend. Now I want somebody to, to know if you're watching the video, it's going to happen. Don't take your chances and stand before God naked without being clothed in the righteousness of Jesus. Amen. Amen. And if you'll, if you'll mean business with God, he'll mean business with you. He knows it. Yeah. He knows when somebody means business with him. Amen. And when you do, I'm telling you, your life will never be the same. Oh, thank you, Lord. I'm so glad he saved a sinner like me. Yeah. Amen. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Yeah. It pleased the Father to accept the death of Jesus for the remission of the world's sins. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. How do you think it makes the Lord feel when people refuse mm -hmm. to see this and hold on to self and offer self-righteousness to God Amen. and say, here, Lord, take this instead. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I wish I could really preach, but in a church like this, after you done heard these things so many times, I wish I could bring up Cain right now, but most... People, you start bringing up candy, be like, yeah, that's right. Get them, preacher, because I know I'm able. Huh. I'm just telling you right now, we better be careful when we start walking in self-righteousness. Yes. Instead of walking, see, Abel offered up that slain lamb. Cain's like, look at this fruit, Lord. Look what I grew for you. <laughs> look what I'm offering up. Don't think more highly of yourself than what you ought to, Christian. Yeah. No, help us, Lord. Help us, Lord. Let's not be prideful. 
Let's not start judging ourselves based upon other people's lives. Let's judge ourselves. Jesus is the plumb line. Yes. Jesus is the plumb line. Amen. Let us judge it based on that. Lord, help us. The Apostle Paul said, judge yourself whether you be in the faith so that you don't have to be judged. Amen. That's a good word right there. Thank you, Pablo. <laughs> you know, I need, to, I need to judge my own self whether I be in the faith. Because listen to me, friend, whenever Jesus, you're born again, and if you're living your life as a living sacrifice, and, and, and you're being transformed, and Jesus is being manifest in your life, that's fruit. That's fruit. Amen. And listen, you might say, well, you know, I messed up today. We all messed up today. Yes. And I'm not trying to belittle it. But Lord, help us. Help us to grow in Christ. Amen? Amen. Praise God. Let's take a look at Romans chapter 4, verses 1 through 2. It says, What shall we say then that Abraham our father, as pertaining to the flesh, has found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he has whereof to glory, but not before God. So there you go. You're not going to accomplish anything in your flesh or through works that is going to be pleasing to God. Instead, in verse 3, it says, what says the scripture? Abraham believed God. Hallelujah. Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. And it, based upon faith, and that word counted is kind of like, a, it's kind of like an, an accounting term. Like they didn't know this back then, but, but today you can say the guilty one died in place of the innocent. I'm sorry. The innocent one died in place of the guilty one. Right. And on the cross, there was a transference that took place. Jesus took Matt's sin on him. And when I said yes to Jesus, Jesus gave me his righteousness. Amen. And, and because of my faith, you could say that there was a wireless transfer that took place. And the Lord put righteousness in Matt's account based on faith. And he put righteousness in your account based on faith. Hallelujah. Based on the faith of the Son of God. And based upon your faith in him and what he did. Amen. Praise God. Now look at verse 17. I, I, this is kind of just repeating in scripture what I just told you. It says, for if by one man's offense, death reigned by one. What does that mean? Adam committed an offense that caused death to reign over the human race. Much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. I just wanted you to see that righteousness is a gift. So, so far we traveled through that, that, that the discipline of God will bring us to a place where we start to realize, you know what? I don't have what I need. <laughs> you understand? You'll, you'll come to the realization when you go through the trials of life and it, 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 that, you know, I don't have what I need. I need, I need to be hungering and thirsting after God's righteousness. And, and, and then you'll start to hunger and thirst after God's righteousness. And then you'll start to realize it's not your righteousness. He's the righteous one. And then you'll be thankful that the Lord clothed you with the righteousness of Jesus. Amen. And you'll realize he gave it to you as a gift because you didn't sure enough earn nothing. Come on. Amen. Oh, but man, I know the Lord loved the way I see. I worship. I worship with two hands, my friend. I watch y'all sometimes. Like, and I'm not saying that about y'all now, but I used to be at the whole church. I used to use that as an analogy. I, I see y'all sometimes. Y'all got one hand lifted up like that. Man, I got two hands up in the air. Or I talked to somebody about Jesus today when I went to buckle. <laughs> okay? And when's the last time you talked to somebody about Jesus, right? I'm just trying to say that we can get caught up in this thing and we'll start judging and basing our righteousness based upon what we do instead of what he did. And I'm telling you right now, that's self-righteousness. Yes. And that stinks in the nostrils of God. Amen. But the righteousness of Jesus, oh, that's a beautiful thing. And if you're yes, not learning yes. how to walk in humility like that, man, I'm telling you, that's the, look, that's the next part of it right there. Verses, verses 20 and 21 of chapter 5, Romans. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. That as sin has reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. So y'all know what the word reign means, right? It's like a king, right? A king in his, in his kingdom. He's reigning 
in his kingdom. And, and I've shared that, that, that definition of, of grace with you before, right? That it's a divine influence. On the heart and the reflection in what? Your life. In the life. So grace is not just your forgiving. Praise God for that, right? Yes. But grace is an ongoing working of the Holy Spirit Amen. that's Amen. moving and operating in your heart and transforming you into the image of Jesus, Amen. forming Christ in you. My old pastor made this great comment, Brad Bullock, got to give him credit because it just doesn't get any better than this. Grace is an inside job. Yeah. Yes. When we yield and understand that it's Jesus' righteousness that clothes us and we yield to the will of God, then now grace is a divine influence. It's a power. It's not just forgiveness. It's a power, an ongoing working that's changing you on the inside, amen, and making you look like Jesus. Yes, yes. Praise God. Yes. Cut you. Cut me some slack, Don. How, how's that song going? Mm -hmm. I'm going to go ahead and sing this. He's still working on me. To make me what I ought to be. Amen. It took you just a day to make the moon and the stars, Jupiter and Mars, but he's still working on me. <laughs> Come on. Hey, cut me some slack. <laughs> and but don't use it as an excuse That's right. to sin, right? Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. So, what is righteousness? Jesus. What does God accept as righteousness for people? Jesus' sacrifice. Yes, yes. What is the first step that must take place in order for Jesus' righteousness to work in your life? Yourself must die. Now that you've been gifted with Jesus' righteousness, what can reign in your life? Grace. Finally, now that we got you or us out of the way, God's righteousness, Jesus, can be revealed in our life, through our in our lives. Amen? Amen. Praise God. Romans chapter 6. It says this, that I'm about to close. It says, know ye not that to whom you yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants you are to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. I think I want to turn to the next verse because I want to find the one that I'm looking for. Y'all heard me teach this quite a bit, but I, but I want to try to make a point since we've been in this in this righteousness information here. Romans chapter 6. Let's, let's go to verse 13 and then we'll read a couple of verses right here. Romans chapter 6 verse 13. Well, well go back to 12. I'm sorry. <clears throat> Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, right? Sin's not your king. Come on, Christian. That's right. Sin's not your king. You don't have to listen to him. Oh, right. he, you don't have to listen to the command of that king. He's been dethroned. The question is, do you believe it or do you want it? Right. Yes. Sometimes we play around with our sin longer than what we should because we kind of like the way it makes our flesh do. Yeah. Right. But fear not. The Lord knows how to chase in those who he loves. Amen. I promise you, discipline's coming. Amen. I can attest to that. Yes, yes. I can put my hand on the Bible and raise the other hand and say, I'm a witness yes. that if you don't give it up, friend, He's going to blow the storm, the winds of the storm, your way. He knows how to get his people home. Yes, yes. Amen. And he's merciful like that. Praise God. All right. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body that you should obey it in the lust thereof. Look at this. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. You know, y'all have heard me say this, but what is a member? It's a body part. Your hands, your feet, your mouth, your eyes, your ears. And back whenever I was in the world, you can, you can plug in your own thing. What was your thing before Jesus? Some of y'all like, dude, you don't want to know my thing. I get it. <laughs> no boss. <laughs> okay. But what was your thing, right? 
And, and some people are like, well, my day wasn't really that bad. I just lied every now and then. Or I beat up a couple of people. Or, you know, I might have pilfered some stuff from the job site. You know, but it wasn't like you. Okay, well, but let me tell you something. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But what I want you to know is this, is that your members are your body parts. And that word instruments literally in the Greek means weapons of warfare. So what it's saying is, is that before Christ, you used to use your body parts as weapons of warfare for the kingdom of darkness. Some of y'all know what I'm talking about. Some of y'all that, that become real, real quick. Now, sometimes people's sin was done all out in the open, and sometimes people's sin done behind closed doors. But sin is sin, right? Yeah. And so we used to, so we used to use our members as instruments or weapons of warfare for the kingdom of darkness. Some of what I did when I was in the world before Christ, I hurt other people through my sin. I drug them down through my sin. Okay, but he's saying, but now you're something new. You see, now that you've done been through the discipline, now that you understand Jesus is who, who true righteousness is, now that you understand it was his blood, now that you've been clothed in his righteousness, now that you're saved, now that the Holy Spirit lives in your heart, you're now... Now the, the, the truth of God and Jesus can come out of you. And instead of, and sometimes, sometimes it can be just your mouth. Have you ever hurt anybody with your mouth? Yes. Have you ever lied on anybody? Have you ever gossiped behind people? Dude, the word of God talks about that. I'm just going to be real with you, man. I'm not going to sit here and sugarcoat it. The Word of God talks about that kind of stuff. It puts gossip and murder in the same verse. That's right. Yes. yes. God doesn't like it whenever we act naughty like that. Whenever we talk about His people or whatever. He'll change you, though, if you'll let Him. Amen. Yes. I, you know, look, i got to hustle up because it's getting late. But look, I never, could, still to this day, cannot understand why after I got saved and, and after I quit doing most of the crazy stuff I used to do, that whenever I'd sit around the table and start gossiping, why it felt so good. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Like, have y'all ever noticed how whenever you used to gossip, I know y'all don't gossip anymore, but it's almost like you get a high off of it. Why did I enjoy talking bad about people so much? I don't know. It's weird because I'm not, you know, anyway, I'm not going to say that. I don't know why, but, but I enjoyed it way too much. And that ought to show you right there that that's not of the Lord. Amen. And so anyway, what I wanted to really tell you is, is that now that Jesus lives in you, he can start shining through you and that your, that your body parts, singers, musicians, y'all can come for that your body parts no longer have to be weapons of warfare for the kingdom of darkness. Amen. Amen. They can be weapons of warfare for the kingdom of light. Amen. Now, instead of my feet bringing me somewhere I'm not supposed to go. Now, instead of my mouth saying something it's not supposed to say, praise God, I'll never, <laughs> I'll never regret doing street ministry. Never once. I don't expect everybody. That's not everybody's thing. But, but I'll tell you one thing. To, to know whenever I carried that cross and me and I and a couple of these other people came with me out there and I started singing Jesus in the crowd to the kids. And then, and then I told that, that I can remember this one that was the Berwick baseball team. And they were sitting there in that truck, and I, I ran into that dude. I know y'all heard the story already, but I had fixed his toe at the urgent care. His toe he came in with his toe looking like that. And I said, oh, man, you got a displaced fracture. I'm going to numb your toe up. And I put it back into place. And that dude, I've seen him three, four times ever since then. He just, it, it, like, he's like, dude, you fixed my toe. And so we're walking, we're walking over there. And he's like, hey, there's the dude that fixed my toe. I'm like, hey, bro, she's going to sing Jesus to y'all right here. She starts singing Jesus to this, to, this, to this little crowd right here. And I can see out the corner of my eye the whole Berwick baseball team with all their girlfriends. They sitting down there. And then all of a sudden, they turn the music down. They turn their music down. I said, oh, yeah. Hallelujah. I said, Naya, when she, when I said, she was done, I said, don't even pick up your stuff. We're going across the street. And she started singing Jesus to them kids. And whenever she was done, I said, y'all think Taylor Swift loves your soul like this girl right here? Oh, 
No, sir. I said, that's right. Taylor Swift don't love your soul. She working for the other team. But let me tell you, this girl, what she just sang to you is the hope that you need. And I'm telling you what, them kids let me pray with them. And praise God. What am I trying to say? I used to let these feet carry me to places I had no business going. I used to let this mouth say things that I had no business saying. But praise God. Hallelujah. I'm going to be used by the King. Amen. Thank you, Jesus.